All right, the book of Genesis. We're going to go through, I'm going to look at the character of Joseph. Not the character as in the Bible, but he's not fictional. I'm talking about the, his character, like his ethics, his responsibilities. We're going to look at that this morning. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to kind of go all through the, kind of the, the whole story of Joseph here. But I want to show you some things that I think will be a blessing to us today as we, as we uh, learn from the Word of God. I believe that God gives us different, different um, people in the Bible to learn from their character, their, their, what they, mistakes they made, things like that. But if you're going to look at someone's character, you know, look at someone in their Bible, you don't want to, you want to look at their character and how their faith and how they live their life. All of Joseph's character was based on his faith. And we'll see that throughout Scripture here as we read it. But there is some, Joseph came from a very dysfunctional family. Um, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at people today, a lot of families today have a lot of dysfunction. But I want to show you this. This is, this is Joseph's family. This is Joseph's family. He used to have, I've got a pretty dysfunctional family. I think Joseph's got his beat. Joseph's got to be. Here's a dysfunctional family he came from. His father was known for deception and trickery. His name was Jacob. He was known for deception and trickery. He stole, his, his father stole the birthright from his uncle. He went in and stole the birthright from his father, from his uncle. He and his brother had a huge falling out. So Jacob and his brother had a huge falling out. And, um, and he, he even, and he even um, tricked him for the birthright. Not only did he, he lie to his dad to get the birthright, but he, he, you know, he tricked his brother and his mom got involved. It was a big mess. It was talking about scandals. His mom lied to his dad for him. He, his mom was against his dad and against his brother. And she, his mom actually loved him and favored him more than she loved both of his sons. Like she, instead of loving sons equally, she loved Jacob more than she loved Esau. His grandfather, who was Abraham, right, almost lost his wife to another man trying to pretend that she was his that he was that she was his sister. That was Sarah. Remember when we went to Egypt and there's a whole fallout there? So you see that his uncle picked on his dad, his uncle, uh, Isaac and, and Ishmael, his his uncle Ishmael picked on his dad to a point where it even caused such a problem where his grandfather kicked his uncle out of the house. Because so much friction in the house. It kicked him out. That's pretty messed up. His his un, his grandfather, um, his, his sorry his his uh, his grandfather just up and left everything he had on a human standpoint, picked up everything he had, his house and home and livelihood, picked up everything and just left and moved out of, moved out of his country, just moved, just up and just up and up and walked out and just started moving, crazy for, for on the human aspect. That's where Abraham did. His brother took his dad's mistress, so Jacob uh, Joseph's brother took his dad's mistress and slept with her. I and mean, we're talking about dysfunction. This is crazy stuff. His sister was a harlot. His brothers tried to kill him. And instead of killing him, one brother felt guilty about killing him, sold him to slavery instead. Appreciate that, man. I mean, let's face it. This would be a whole season's worth of stories on any soap opera or a Jerry Springer show. But this is where Joseph came from. So we, we get the idea that Bible, people in the Bible were just perfect. They were always, you know, three-piece suit and a tie. Cuff, you know, everything is, you know, the, you know, the, no. well, you know, um, leave it to beaver home, you know, and everything was just wonderful. Every, but when you look at the Bible and you look at the trouble that God spared them from, it makes me realize that the God, the grace of God was in the Old Testament Amen. as much as it is in the New Testament today. Right. So no matter what we're going through in our life, there's been dysfunction. Face it, we could sit back and talk about our family's dysfunctions. My family put fun in dysfunction. I mean, we just did nothing but mm -hmm. dysfunction. But on all of this, we see some great lessons about Joseph's character and his qualities that made him a great leader and a great person. I want to show you some things first, and these are all alliterated. Imagine that. Go to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. And Jacob dwelt in a land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. So he grew up, he dwelt in a land where his father was a stranger. He was an immigrant. He was an immigrant. He wasn't known in the area. He was an immigrant, okay? And then it says in verse number, um, verse number two, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. That's dysfunctional. And Joseph brought unto his, his, unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children. Now we know that Israel is Jacob. It's a name that God gave him. Because he, was of the, because he was the son of his old age. 
and he made him a, and, and he made him a coat of many colors. So jo Jacob made Joseph a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, talk about dysfunction. I mean, they didn't even want to talk to each other peaceably. They were constantly at odds, and they couldn't even speak peaceably to him. You know, if we can't speak peaceably to someone, first we've got to check our hearts and lives. But if, if, if we can't even speak peaceably to another person, that, that kind of shows me we, we aren't even communicate with them because it's going to come out with hatred. We got to we got to keep our mouths. We got to keep our keep our hearts with all diligence. But look what it says in verse number five. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Joseph con tried continuing keeping a line of uh, communication with his brethren, even though they hated him, even though they wanted nothing to do with him. He tried to keep an open line of communication. How many of us have family members that we try to keep that open line of communication despite they don't want anything to do with us? That's kind of hard to do. I've got family members like that. It's kind of rough. It's like they don't want anything to do with us. Do you, do you continue trying? Do you not try? And it's, it's kind of rough. But number one in all this, in all of this, in all of the hatred and dysfunction in his house, Joseph did not allow his past or his present to detour his future. His goals were set on principle, not on passion. This is something that I have to do, that I deal with on a constant basis, that I want to make sure the decisions I'm making for the church are not on whims. They've got to be set on principle. And it's hard, because sometimes you can get sucked up with, you can get sucked up in a, in a direction, you get sucked up in a, in a feeling or in, a, or in an impulse, and it can mess you up. But his, Joseph's goals were not, set up, were not set in his passion, what he was experiencing at the time. They were set on principle. And how do we know that? Well, look at verse number 6. And he said unto them, Here I pray you the dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose and, the, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said, un, said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. So we look at we look at there. He came and he told him his dreams. He came and told him what his plan was, his vision, what he wanted, what, what he what he saw. By the way, visions come from God. Yeah. Visions come from God. When we stop and realize, you know, the Bible says where, where no vision is, the people perish. When you start explaining, we faced it here at this church. When we shared the vision, when I shared what God was laying on my heart, the vision to move out of Hartville and to move to Lakemore and to move to this location, God was showing me that. People didn't like that. It, we lost people because of that decision. We lost people because they, they saw it as just another, oh, you know, we're just trying to, you know, flee or we're trying to destroy or whatever it may have been. But I believe with all my heart that God has us here for a purpose. Amen. There's a purpose for that. And um, we're thankful for that. I mean, we have Julie here today. Amen. And, you know, if Julie right. trusted Christ because we were out door knocking yeah. in this area. If we had not come to this area, we probably wouldn't be door knocking in Lakemore. So I believe that was worth it all right, for that right there. Yeah. But goals are set on principle, not on passion. Passion can be set on principle, but principle can never be set on passion. You can never put the cart before the horse. It's okay to be excited about the vision that God gives you, but you don't ever want the, the excitement to be the vision. You want the vision to be the excitement. Did I, make the, did I muddy that up pretty clear? So we want to make sure that our, you know, you, you always hear it with you know, young people trying to give them counsel. Why? I just love him. I can't explain it, but I just love him. Okay, well, is it set on principle? Is he, is he a good person? Does he have morals? Does he have ethics? Does he treat his parents right? Is he right with his brother and sisters? Does he have a good work ethic? I don't know, but he's just really cute. Okay, well, <laughs> and, and, or, or hey, she, or man, she's just really, she's got a great smile. Okay, well, is she, is she a good, is she, is she submissive to her parents? Is she learning to be a keeper at home? Is she, is she respectful to her parents? Is she, does she have a good reputation? Is she a hard worker? Well, I don't know, but I just really love him. Well, I just really, you know, I really love her. I love, you know, it, it, it's, it's, love is that emotion that can kind of flay back and forth, but the principle is what stands. And when we say love, what really means we lost or we're enticed or we're drawn away puppy love. But the principle matters. There was a situation recently where I, I was telling Ed about it. I said, there is something that, there's a passion that's bothering me that's not set on principle. And I have prayed about it, and I and God, I believe God's given me victory over it. Where I don't have that passion anymore, it's all in principle again. And I'm thankful for that because we have to make sure we're maintaining on principle and not on passion. 
But here, look at look what it says in verse number verse number nine. So here's here's Joseph. He realizes all that was going on. He has a vision. He's excited about what God's given him. And what happens? He tells his brethren. His brethren hate him even more. So Joseph stops dreaming. Joseph stops having that vision. Joseph stops living by passion or by living by principle. He stops trusting what God gives him. No. He says, and he dreamed yet another dream, and he told it to his brethren. And he tells him again, and then it says, and then he told it to his father and to his brethren. God gave him something. He gave him a vision. He gave him purpose, and his family hated him. His family rebuked him. His father rebuked him. But he did not allow his past of what he was raised in or what he was being raised with to, do, to deter his future goals, or to, to deter his goals. He did not allow his past to deter him. You know, no matter what decision it is, God gives us a passion. God gives us a purpose. We don't have to worry about whether man likes it or not. We have to do what God wants us to do. The Bible says we're supposed to be obedient to God. The fear of man bringeth a what? Bringeth a snare. So if we're always trying to focus on what getting man's approval and not God's approval, or what God tells us to do something and it doesn't line up with what man says, hey, we obey God, not man. Amen? Right. But look at it in chapter 37, verse number 5. We go back to this. It says that Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, hated him yet more. And he says, hey, here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. So his dream, his goals were, high, you know, he had high goals. His dreams were bigger, and he had big dreams. He had big things that he wanted from his life. But it says here he had high goals. Hey guys, he had high, he had a, uh, he had high goals. But look at it in verse number, eight, verse number seven, and, it's, and he says that they, all these sheaves bowed down and and and, and uh, were made obeisance to my sheep. And in Genesis thirty-seven verse nine, he says he dreamed it. He dreamed another dream. And then it says that the sun and moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. The eleven stars and the sun and moon, every, they, all, they all bowed down and made obeisance to me. That's pretty rough stuff. And he says, and by the way, when you tell a dream, when you kind of tell it, people kind of know what your dream is. They, they kind of get on hold of it, and they don't like the application of it, but they understand. Look at verse number 10. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come down, come down to bow down to ourselves to thee and to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So here he is. He he dreamed big. He wasn't afraid to have these goals and visions. What you know to have these uh, have these um, high goals. He had he had a purpose. What he wanted for his life, and those things did not detour him. Think of it. He had these dreams. He had this vision from God. He had a purpose that God gave him. And his brethren hated it for it. It could have been jealousy. It, it was mostly jealousy. The Bible says in verse number in verse number 11 that they envied him. That's jealousy. They had envy towards his brethren. They didn't like the fact that he was given a special dream. First, he's given special, special privilege from his father. And then he's given special privilege and it's different, a, a dream or a, or a higher goal or something more than what they were. And they were upset. I mean, here they were shepherds. They're taking care of the sheep, and they're out there binding sheaves, and they're doing work, and all of a sudden, here's, all, all, their, all their sheaves are bowing down to worship Joseph. What Joseph was basically saying was, I'm going to rule you one day. I'm going to rule you one day. Now, the younger, breath, younger kids, they kind of rule the older, don't they? Doesn't that usually what happens? The you know, younger one kind of says something, Mom, the big brother, big, you know, sister's doing such and such, and it usually goes the baby's way. Or the baby the family kind of gets their own way. Ever notice that, or is it just me? Anybody like that? Growing up, my brother Andrew, it, j it just, on a side note, uh, my brother Andrew, it didn't matter whose birthday it was, he would get the biggest piece of cake, he would get, the, he would get all the rest of the cake every morning. If you didn't get down there and, get, and claim your territory on your birthday cake the next morning, he took the cake. I mean, he scored the whole thing. It didn't matter. He had his birthday, he had four birthday cakes on his birthday. Four days of celebrating his birth. We got like a half a day. My mom, my dad would take the day off to make sure he was there for my brother's birthday. Me, my dad pulled overtime. I mean, just things like that. But it was always about the baby of the family. You know what I'm saying? The baby gets everything. The baby rules the roost. You know, we look at it and see the older kids say, man, that never happened when I was a kid. Man, if that never happened when I was a kid. I remember my brother's, my, my, my wife, she was telling me that some of the stuff that, that she, you know, when, how her parents raised her. Then it came to Andrew, the youngest, because it was, Figure that out. Both babies. My youngest brother is Andrew, and her youngest brother is Andrew. It's kind of cool. 
But it's like, here's Andrew, the baby of the family, getting his way. Man, he just kind of like, he didn't rule the roost, but he got away with stuff that we never did. You know what I'm saying? And you look at that, here's Joseph. He's the kind of, the, right now, he's, as we're the baby of the family. And he's going to say that you're the least among, you're the least of us, the youngest of us. And we're all going to revolve our life around you. We're going to bow down to you. I don't think so. And they were jealous over it. They were jealous over it. In Psalms chapter number, um, sorry, go to chapter number 39. Chapter number 39, Genesis 39. He dreamed big. He had high goals. And here these people kind of like, they, 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 uh, they put him down. They diminished him. They didn't like what he was saying. His father even questioned him. Psalms 39, verses 1, uh, Psalms. Genesis 39, chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 14, excuse me. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and captain of the guard, an Egyptian, um, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had, brought, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a pro prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he, observed, and he served him. And he made him overseer of um, overseer over his house, and all that he had he put under he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and um, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for, the, for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person, and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. And he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my, my master, um, what if not what is with me in the house? And he hath, um, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her, or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his, his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that, that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto, unto, unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. And he came unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. So it says here he was, you know, he was determined. We can look in this passage, what we read here. We can see that he was determined that natural temptations were not going to slow him down or deter him. What I'm trying to say is he was not deterred by natural temptation. He, the Bible says he was a great, he was a goodly man. He was in charge of everything. He, could, he had the bank account. He had the keys to the Ferrari or whatever kind of car you had, to the truck, whatever he had. He had everything he had, everything there was. He was in charge of this house. He answered to Potiphar and to Potiphar alone. That was it. And his, he had everything, all this, any servant, any of the, any of the maidens that he had, any of the uh, lady servants that they had, he could have had, he could have, he could have dated any one of them, he could have been with any one of them he wanted to. Everything was his except Potiphar's wife, and that's and everything she wanted Joseph's because it was powerful because of who he was. She wanted to have, she wanted to have part of that, and he could have easily given into temptation, but he was determined that the natural temptations were not going to slow him down. Or deter him. Nothing was going to stop him from doing what his goals were. Nothing was going to stop him from being the ethical, goodly man that he was. And you can see that God was with him. God was favor. God's favor was upon him, and God was blessing him. But he was determined that nothing of this world that they offer was going to slow him down or deter him. Here is this woman who had the major hots for him, and he backed off and he went the opposite way. He ran. He let, he, he let the, some people say he left his coat and kept his integrity. He chose not to go that route. He chose not to fall into sin. But he was determined that the natural temptations of lust, of sinful pleasure, was not going to slow him down to deter him. 
How many of us can honestly say that when we're tempted with every temptation that we have, that we choose not to give in temptation, and we choose to do what's above board? That's a good. That's a good man. That's that's a man that's that's a man who's taking his time and, and is doing it God's way. But here he is, he was de- he was determined with natural temptations. He could have used his power and influence, and he could have had his way, and he chose not to. Look at chapter thirty nine, uh, verses one through fourteen again. You see this. He displayed integrity. He displayed integrity. He handled pressure and problems responsibly. He chose not to let Potiphar's wife um, change how he how he behaved. His integrity, you know, we have an integrity crisis in the world today. There was a guy, his name was Warren Rearsby. He wrote a book called The Integrity Crisis. He's about 30 years old. Now, Warren Rearsby is not a King James only kind of guy. He uses a different kind of Bible. But the guy wrote a book called The Integrity Crisis. And in it, he talks about how there's a lack of integrity among God's people, among preachers. How many times do you hear about a preacher going down the wrong way with a different, with a, you know, with, with wrong um, you know, wrong conduct with the opposite sex, or with financial uh, issues, or they're or they're twisted with their power and influence, and they use it abruptly. The Bible says that Joseph here displayed integrity. He handled pressure and problems responsibly. When you're faced with with a sin, it is better to flee and face the consequences of fleeing from that sin rather than to take into that sin. And he he ran. He took off. He he he, re, he refused to do it. He says in verse number in verse number nine, he says, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He realized that any sin that we commit is not against one another, it's against God. And so he realized that and he wanted to keep his integrity, and so he fled. Look at chapter thirty nine, verses tw- verse twenty one through um, verse number We'll look at verse number 20. So we know what happens here. Potter, Potiphar finds out what's going on. Potiphar got upset and uh, and threw him into prison. He was wrapped with Kindle, threw him into prison. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of, of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. So you see here that he disciplined himself to succeed, regardless of his location or his position. No matter where he was, if he was serving his father, he was well favored. If he was in Potiphar's house, he, was, he disciplined himself, he served, and he was well favored. Now he's in the prison house. For crimes he did not commit, he's in the he's in the prison. He's there unjustly, but he's being prospered. God's prospering him, and he's doing everything right. He disciplined himself to succeed, regardless of his position. Here he is in prison in the jailhouse, and he's still not giving up on the vision that God gave him. He's still doing what's right. He's still maintaining his integrity. He's still maintaining his character, and now he's in charge of the prison as a prisoner. He was the prisoner in charge of the prison. So then what happens is we know what happens is Pharaoh's butler and baker, they get together and they, and they, uh, they have, you know, they have a, for whatever reason, the king got mad and threw him and got him, got mad and they threw him into the prison. And while they're there, Joseph hears their story and they're going to about the, you know, he tells him one's going to get hanged, the other one's not going to get hanged and the king's going to kill one and not the other. And he tells him the story and he says, Hey, I'm going to tell you what it is, but here's, a, here's, I'm going to tell you the interpretation of your dream. But when you do, when you, when I tell you, you have to remember me. You have to tell. You have to remember me and get me out of here. And they agreed. And they agreed. And then they one gets killed, the other gets restored. In verse number twenty-one of chapter forty, it says, "And he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into the, into the Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet he did. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. So here he is. He was told." And he was told, um, he told him the dream, he kept his part of the bargain, he, he told the interpretation of it, and he forgot him. And in verse number 40, in chapter 41, verse 1, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by a river. Two years it took for him to remember his word, to remember his part of the bargain. Two years it took for Joseph to be remembered after he spared that guy's life. 
but he declined to be discouraged when other people forgot him. Ever been where you've, where you've made a deal with somebody, or you've, or you've ministered to somebody, or you've been, you've been, with some, you've been uh, a blessing to somebody, and they say, I'm going to remember this, and time I can help you, you let me know. And then that time comes around, you let that person know, and it's like, no help, no help, no help. Or they forgot you, and it's kind of like, okay, yeah, so what? And, and it's, like that, it's sad when that happens. But he declined to be discouraged when other people forgot him. It is easy to be discouraged. Nowhere did Joseph maintain his, his, his work. Joseph maintained his dreams, his vision. And all this what took place, all this what took place, he refused to let that get him down. And the opportunity to, to, uh, presented itself, and the, and, the, and, the, and the butler remembered. He's like, oh yeah, I forgot about this guy Joseph. I was in prison when he did this to me. And, and he can tell you the dream. He can tell you what happened. He can give you the answers you're looking for. But he declined to be discouraged when people forgot about him. Go to chapter number 41, verses 34 through 36. I love what he says in verse number 16. Joseph said unto Pharaoh, it is not in me. It's not me. That's what we say, amen. It's not me. I didn't do it. It's not of me. It's God. It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh such an answer of peace. So we, we know that all, all glory belongs to God. But in verses 34 through 36, Joseph did something. He could have easily manipulated. He could have easily done things different. But it says in verse, I'll go back to verse 33. We know the, the dream he had was about seven lean cattle coming out and taking out the seven, the seven fat cattle. And, uh, and the seven lean cattle, you know, they didn't, they didn't get big at all. They just kind of maintained the same size. We know it's talking about uh, the, the, the plague that's going to take place, the famine that's going to take place in Egypt. And the Pharaoh said, okay, he's like, you're going to have seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And it's going to, it's going to have 100% here and 100% there is going to balance you out. But if you don't lay up and stop, you're not going to have, a, you're not going to have, a blend, you're not going to have um, any blessing. You're not going to have any, anything for tomorrow. And it says in verse number 33, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out, look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. So he's not just talking about over his father's house. He's not just talking about over Potiphar's house. He's not talking about his prison house. He's saying, set this man over Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good, of those, of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be in store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, and um, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto the servants, Can we find such a one as, um, such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? In whom the Spirit of God is. Now, dispensationalists will say that the Holy Spirit did not reside in people in the Old Testament. Hyper dispensations will say that. Well, here the Bible says, here he is. Here's a man that is in whom the Spirit of God is in him. Isn't that pretty? Isn't this a powerful verse right there? Verse 39. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, By the way, does the Spirit of God indwell a person who's not saved? So Joseph was a believer, right? Well, how could a person receive the spirit of, the, of, of God if he's not saved. That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's kind of always, it's one of those things you kind of find through scripture and find that. Verse number 39, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word sh um, shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. So he says, "All is, I'm going to put you in charge. You're going to be the second. You're going to be. You're going to be my vice president. You're going to be the one in charge. You're going to answer only to me." Now we know the rest of the story about what happens here. Is we know that jo um, that Jacob's family and his brothers they came in the time of famine. They came to is came to Egypt, needing corn, ready to buy some corn, and they came in. They had wound up bowing themselves to Joseph, not knowing that it was Joseph. And we know all this took place. And Joseph saw it, and he wept. He saw all that took place. He, you know, through some trickery of his own, kind of, sort of, he gets Benjamin to come, his younger brother. And then you see that he gets his father to come, he gets his father to come to Egypt as well. And then he, re, he tells him, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a Jersey. He, they, they show that he is, that he is, the, that he is the, um, the son. And they bow down and they, and they give reverence. And they, and they respect him and they, and they bow their knee as, as a leader. So dis, dis, he decided what was best permanently, despite what had happened presently. So no matter what had happened, remember Joseph was, 
Could you imagine Joseph standing before before Pharaoh and is in, in bonds? I don't know. I can't, I, I can't say this is what happened. Bible will say it. But you can imagine here's this prisoner in shackles, and and you know handcuffs and shackles, and he's standing before the king, you know before Pharaoh, giving the giving the interpretation of the prophecy, and he goes from prison to prince. He goes from prison to 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 uh, president, vice president. It's pretty awesome. But he decided what was best permanently, despite what had happened presently. He had that long-term goal and refused to let it go. Lastly, his decision was based was his decision making was based on dreams, not on not on intangible goal on intangible not on tangible goals. It was based on vision, not on what was around him. His his purpose, his plan was not on what he could what he could understand, but what God had given him to understand. Look at chapter number fifty. Chapter number fifty. Jacob dies. Jacob dies, and the Bible says that his brethren, when his brother, when they came back, they said, "Okay, now he's going to get back on us. Dad's not here; he's going to get back on us." But we know the verse. Joseph says in verse number fifteen, "And when Joseph's brethren saw that he that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him." And they sent a messenger to Joseph, saying, "Thy father did command us before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, for trespasses thy brother." Now, Daddy said. Go and ask him for forgiveness. And daddy said, you got to forgive us. <laughs> Trying to play that card. You know, well, mom said. Yeah. Then it says, for they, for they did, evil, um, did unto the evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy servants, of the Lord, of, thy, of, the, of the, sorry, the God of thy father. And Joseph wept and they had spoken to him. They still didn't get it. They still didn't understand God's, what God had done. The provision of God. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are thy servant; we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And he says, Look it, you meant it for evil, but God meant it good. We, we, say, we, we, we say that, we, we use that phrase, and it's in this passage here. You, you, you know, you... You meant evil by it, but God had a better purpose. But his, his decisions were based on not present anger, not present situations. His plans were always based on the vision and goals and the dreams that God gave him. And we ought to make sure, we, you know, we as people, ought, we as believers ought to take that same character. Whether you're a believer or not, we ought to take that same character of Joseph and learn from it and apply it to our life that we can be the same type of person. Don't let the things of this world sway us from what we know what God wants us to be and do. Don't let the don't let the world sway us from and discourage us from what God has given us. God has given us a purpose. You know, some maybe maybe God's given you a, a, a burden, or God's given you that desire to be a pastor. Don't let anything sway you. Don't let anything violate. Don't, don't let anything stop you or cause you to violate the qualifications of a pastor. Don't fall in temptation. Stay away from worldly lust. Stay away from those things. Hey, God wants each and every one of us to be called to holiness. Make sure we're let. Make sure we're not going to let anything hinder us from being holy. God wants us to pray. Let nothing stop us from the time of prayer. God wants us to, to share our faith to go soul winning. Let nothing of this world stop us from going soul winning. Don't let anything hinder us from going forward. Stay focused on what God wants. God gives us a vision. God gives us a dream. God gives us a burden. Let nothing of this world, let nothing we're going through deter us from that. So that's, that's some character from, from the life of Joseph. I pray it's a blessing to you this morning. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll get ready for our next service. And uh, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray you'd help this simple lesson. Lord, apply it to our lives. Help us, Lord, to make um, principal decisions and not based on passion or whims. Thank you, Lord, for letting us come to church. I pray you would bless our time of fellowship and the service to follow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.